verses 19 through 29. Romans chapter 9, verses 19 through 29. If you know me at all, you know that this is the strangest and large amount of scripture that I would normally read. But don't be afraid of the length of the scripture. It will not dictate the length of the sermon. Trust me. But I want that would be to read all these verses to set the context of the scripture. Romans chapter number nine, verses nineteen through twenty-nine. Trust that everyone has it. I can thank everyone who stepped in and said they so long. Romans 9, verses 19 through 29, the word of God reads like this. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? But who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, old man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why do you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called or invited, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people my people, and her who was not my beloved my beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people there, they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cried out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is a remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left to us a prosperity, we would have become like Sodom and would have become like the Lord. I want to preach this morning from the subject, God's right to choose. You may have your seats. Thank you very much. Ushers, you're certainly too kind. God's right to choose. God's right to choose. Young boy. that they were isolated from normal, everyday necessities, such as a bathroom. They had an out house. And the young boy hated the out house. He hated the out house for several reasons. First, he hated the out house because in the summer, the out house was hot. Hated the outhouse because, secondly, in the winter, the outhouse was cold. But thirdly, he hated the outhouse because the outhouse always had an unpleasant smell. The young boy hated the outhouse so much that he plotted a plan to push the outhouse into the creek that was behind his house. He knew that when it rained in the country, the rain would cause 
once the creek had risen, the broad plan to push the outhouse into the creek and just watch the outhouse float away. One day the boy got the chance to put his plan into action. Rain began to fall and water began to fill the creek and the boy saw the perfect opportunity to push his outhouse into the creek. And that's exactly what he did. After he had successfully executed his plan, he patted his hands together, went into the house, popped his feet up on the table, and enjoyed his snack. Later on that day, his father had returned home. And his father told the young boy that he needed to meet him in the woodshed. The little boy knew that this was bad news because the only time his father wanted to meet him in the woodshed was to discipline him for doing something that he had no business doing. So without hesitation, the young boy said, Daddy, why do you want to meet me in the wood? Said, to which his father responded, because somebody decided to push the outhouse into the creek, and I think that that somebody was you. <laughs> to which the boy confirmed that yes, Daddy, it was me who pushed the outhouse into the creek. But looking to get himself out of the whooping, the young boy looked at his daddy and said, Daddy, before you make your next decision, let me remind you of George Washington and his boy. You see, George Washington's boy cut down a cherry tree and because he told his father the truth that it was him who cut the tree down, his father did not discipline him. His father smiled and said, you are absolutely correct, but the difference between George Washington and his boy and me and my boy is that George Washington's boy didn't cut the tree down while his daddy was in
you got to say about it? Therefore, the question has to be raised. Why does God have the right to choose who he gives his mercy to? Why is it that God has the right to give his mercy to whomever he chooses? Here in our selected text, the Holy Spirit makes known to us why it is God has the right to give his mercy to whomever he chooses. First, God has the right to give his mercy to whomever he chooses because God is the creator of everything. I thought I would have a witness there. I, 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 I really did think I would have a witness there. God has the right to give his mercy to whomever he chooses because God is the creator. Based on his argument, I'm a 
assuming that my listeners will ask this question based on this argument. But indeed, if this is your question, Paul answers in verse number 20 by saying, you asking the wrong question.
create a first class conditional statement assumes that what follows the if is true. Did you get that? In Greek, a first class conditional statement assumes that what follows the if is true. In other words, when Paul says, what if, he's really saying God is. God is, this in your Bible, willing to demonstrate his wrath. But the reason that God does not immediately demonstrate his wrath is because he wants to show those who belong to him his mercy. Not because he was less significant, just because he had less to say 
then Isaiah and Ezekiel and all the rest of the major prophets. He quotes from Hosea chapter number 2. In Hosea chapter number 2, the context of the scripture there is dealing with the restoration of Israel. God, in Hosea chapter number 2, had abandoned his people because they refused to worship his name. And Paul is trying to make the point here that if God has the audacity to abandon his own people, he has the audacity to abandon you too. But God never abandoned his people without the chance to bring them back. When God puts you in a bad situation, God is only trying to give you a chance to call on his man. But how stubborn is the creation of God? God has your back against the wall. You call everybody but God. God says, I'm the creator of everybody. And if you just call on me, I know what to do to help you. David says, Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's. The fullness thereof. Here's why I'm trying to get in. They that dwell therein. That they that dwell in the earth is both you and I. We belong to God. And because we belong to God, God can either give us his mercy or he can choose not to give us his mercy. But whether he gives it to you or whether he does not give it to you, you Not only does 
God has the right to give his mercy to whomever he wants to give it to because he created everybody. But last thing I promise I didn't see, God has the right to give his mercy to whomever he wants to give his mercy to because God created Israel. Don't know the look of that. God created his friend. Verses 27 through 29, Paul quotes several passages from the prophet Isaiah. He quotes several passages from the prophet Isaiah to prove that God is the creator of his friend. And as the creator of Israel, God has the right to do with Israel whatever he wants to do with Israel. Let me help you. In the Hebrew culture, those who were descendants of Abraham thought that they were automatically receive salvation because of their bloodline was connected to Abraham. And then if they were descendants of Jacob, they thought that they would automatically receive salvation because their bloodline could be traced back to Jacob. Even if they came from Isaac, they thought that they would automatically receive salvation because their bloodline traces back to Isaac. And I that there's somebody here this morning that thinks you automatically receive salvation because mama was saved, uh, or daddy was saved, uh, Amy was saved, uh, Michael was saved. Uh, uh, no one like that. You've got to know God for yourself. And Paul says that God created Israel. He's not saying that just because you were born like community, you automatically receive salvation. Uh -uh. God sent his son. And unless you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal, the Lord and Savior ain't no hope for I don't care who your mama was, or who your daddy was, or who your pastor was, if Christ is not in your heart, Hebrew culture, a name 
To know a person's name denotes that you have authority over that person. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, you did not address a king by his name. Because to call a king by his name would be to say, I got power over you. So you address the king by his title. That's why they call the Egyptian king Pharaoh. Uh, because you address him by his title as a symbol that I don't have authority over you. You have authority over me. So when God says, your name shall be Israel, God is saying, I have control. Chip on your show. People don't like what you said or how you did something or why you said it. 
I'm just a utensil in the hands of God. It doesn't pay us to get mad at God for the inconsistencies in our life when we understand that I belong to God and God has the right to do with my life whatever he wants to do with my life. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how I sleep at night. Because for God I live. For God I die. Bless in the name of the Lord. May God bless you. May God keep you.